In 1936, there was a man by the name of Charles Templeton who was a Canadian born in Toronto, and he came to faith in Jesus Christ and also became an evangelist. He met Billy Graham in those early years in the 1940s, and both of them worked together uh, in the early days of what is known today as Youth for Christ that made a significant impact worldwide, reaching young people for Jesus. He actually founded a church called Avenue Road Church, which was the precursor to our sister church, Bayview Glen Alliance Church, here in the Toronto area. Um, But he had a crisis of faith uh, that he couldn't answer the problem of evil and suffering. Last week, Les shared with us about doubt and about doubting Thomas and how he had this Um, crisis of faith as well, unable to believe until he saw Jesus. And we all go through our doubts, and I hope that you were encouraged by the message last Sunday that doubts can be a catalyst to help us to also uh, dig deeper into our faith. Um, But he shared, Charles Templeton shared his doubts, his concerns, his crisis of faith with his friend, Billy Graham. And uh, after sharing where he was going, and Billy responded uh, to where he was in his faith, And Charles Templeton felt that Billy Graham was committing intellectual suicide, that he wasn't really evaluating uh, properly the problems uh, within his faith. And so Charles Templeton became an agnostic, and he even wrote a book called Farewell to God and talked about his crisis of faith and why he didn't believe uh, in, in God anymore. About 50 years later, He was interviewed by a man named Lee Strobel. Les read a a portion of Lee's book uh, called Case for Christ last week. And I want to read a portion of his book from Case for Faith because Lee Strobel went to interview Charles Templeton as he was getting ready to write this book, Case for Faith, to really talk about faith and and the case for it. And this is what he said. This is how the conversation went. And how do you assess this Jesus? This is Lee speaking. And how do you assess this Jesus? It seemed like the next logical question, but I wasn't ready for the response it would evoke. Templeton's body language softened. It was as if he, felt, he suddenly felt relaxed and comfortable in talking about an old dear friend. His voice, which at times had displayed such a sharp, insistent edge, now took on a melancholy and reflective tone. His guard seemingly down, he spoke in an unhurried pace, almost nostalgically, carefully choosing his words as he talked about Jesus. He was, Templeton began, the greatest human being who has ever lived. He was a moral genius. His ethical sense was unique. He was the intrinsically wisest person that that I've ever encountered in my life or in my readings. His commitment was total and led to his own death, much to the detriment of the world. What could one say about him except that this was a form of greatness? I was taken aback, Lee said. You sound like you really care about him, I said. Well, yes, he is the most important thing in my life, came his reply. I, I... I, he stuttered, searching for the right word. I know it may sound strange, but I have to say, I adore him. Everything good I know, everything decent I know, everything pure I know, I learned from Jesus. Yes, yes, and tough. Just look at Jesus. He castigated people. He was angry. People don't think of him that way, but they don't read the Bible. He had a righteous anger. He cared for the oppressed and exploited. There's no question that he had the highest moral standard, the least duplicity, the greatest compassion of any human being in history. There have been many other wonderful people, but Jesus is Jesus. Uh, But, no, he said slowly, he is the most, he stopped, then started again. In my view, he declared, he is the most important human being who has ever existed. That's when Templeton uttered the words, I never expected to hear from him, 
Quote, and if I may put it this way, he said as his voice began to crack, I miss him. With that, tears flooded his eyes. He turned his head and looked downward, raised his left hand to shield his face from me, and his shoulders bobbed as he wept. Isn't that amazing? For a man who once proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ, then to go towards agnosticism, and then finally, 50 years later, this was a couple of years before he passed away, to acknowledge the magnitude of the person of Jesus Christ. We've been on this series, and today is our last uh, day as we study Jesus' resurrection and beyond. Next Sunday is Father's Day, and after that we're going to start part four of our sort of series on Jesus as we look at the parables of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus throughout our summer uh, series. But as we end this aspect about the resurrection and beyond, I want to bring us back to what we've been looking at for this whole year. As I said at the beginning uh, in the fall, we want to do a reset. We, as we studied rebuilding and renewal, we want to do a reset and bring us back to the foundation of what it really means to be a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus, is to be able to understand the person, the magnitude, the greatness, the humility, the kindness, the love, the extraordinary supernatural nature of this man, Jesus Christ, and the impact that he has on all of our lives and throughout all of human history and in time to come as well. And so as we end this section of Jesus, resurrection and beyond, I want us to look at Jesus, our coming king, because this is a hope that God has given to us. As Jesus was taken up into heaven, as he ascended, we studied the ascension some weeks ago, as Jesus ascended into heaven, and the disciples there, and they stood there, and they looked up, seeing Jesus go up into heaven, and the angels were there, and they came down, and they said, don't worry, this same Jesus will come back to you in the same way that he has gone. And there was that promise that was given. As part of the Christian and Missionary Alliance, which is the denomination that we are a part of, there is a distinctive called the fourfold gospel. And part of this fourfold gospel highlights four key and critical aspects of the person of Jesus that is really important to us. He is savior, number one. He is sanctifier, number two. He is healer, number three. And number four is that he is coming king. Now, this aspect of Jesus being coming king is an aspect that's not often talked about. It's, it's uh, out of probably all four of them, is an aspect that is, is quite neglected. Now, I'm not going into what's called the study of eschatology, which is the study of the end times and tell you about, you know, this thing and that thing and all these other things that we can get into. But what I'd like to share with you first is just what our statement of faith is about Jesus' second coming. And this is what our statement of faith, the Alliance in Canada says, says this, the second coming of the Lord, Jesus Christ, is eminent and will be personal and visible. As the believer's blessed hope, this vital truth is an incentive for holy living and sacrificial service toward the completion of Christ's commission. So this is a nice Compact statement here doesn't get into a lot of other uh, details because you could study for time and eternity until Jesus comes and after he comes and everything is done, you could still keep on studying about it. But here it talks about, and, and our life groups will be digging into this a little bit more this week. And if you're not in a life group, please let us know if you'd like to join one. Uh, it says here, the coming of the Lord is number one, imminent, number two, personal, and number three, visible, right? Right? And it, what that means is that it's imminent. It'll, it can happen at any time. It's going to be personal. It's not something that's just uh, something that a, a big group of people, but it's something personal for each one of us. This is the beauty of Jesus, that we all can have a personal relationship. He is imminent. He is close to us. He is, it's going to be something that's person, personal. And it's going to be visible, that we will be able to see his return. And as the believer's blessed hope, and Inez read for us in in Titus chapter 2, it talks about that blessed hope, and we're going to dig into that passage this morning and look at a few things from that passage. That blessed hope helps us. It's a vital truth for holy living and also sacrificial service towards the completion of the Great Commission. 
And as you've heard over and over and over again here, and we're going to talk about it over and over and over again, is that we all have a mission to complete that God has given to us. And that is to go out and share the good news of Jesus Christ until all, ha- all know. To go to the, to the far most utter ends of the earth, even like Derek and Bonnie have gone, to share the gospel to unreached places. And we, we often don't think about this aspect of Jesus as our coming king, but Jesus as our coming king has great significance for us. This blessed hope has great significance for us. And so I just want to highlight a few things here from Titus chapter 2, from what we read, a few different things about what does this blessed hope of Jesus' return actually lead us to? If we acknowledge and believe and accept and, and take that blessed hope as something that we live with, with a daily ba- on a daily basis, what does that blessed hope actually lead us towards? Here are a few things. Number one, it leads us to a life of personal holiness. If there is an expectation of his imminence, if there's an expectation that Jesus is coming back for us, which the scriptures clearly teach, then it should lead us also into a life of holiness. As Titus, in Titus chapter two, as we read, it's saying no to ungodliness. It's saying no to worldly passions. It's to live an upright life before the Lord. It's to live a godly life in this present evil world while we wait for that blessed hope. John says it this way in 1 John chapter two, chapter three, he says this, dear friends, we are already God's children. But he has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. But we do know that when we will, that we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this eager expectation, how many here have an eager expectation for Jesus' coming? Hopefully maybe everyone else by the end of this message will have an eager expectation for Jesus' coming, right? But all that have this eager expectation will do what? will keep themselves pure just as he is pure. See, the hope of the coming of the Lord, that blessed hope should lead us towards personal holiness. In putting away sin, putting away unrighteousness, putting away iniquity in our lives, and turning towards Jesus in his fullness so that we can live holy, upright lives, lives of integrity and righteousness that he's calling us to live. Paul says it like this in Thessalonians. Now may the God of peace make you holy. In which way? In every way. And may your whole spirit, here he talks about us being a tripartite being, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until the Lord Jesus Christ comes again. God will make this happen for he who calls you is faithful. See, this is a work that the Lord does as we yield to him, that God wants to keep us holy, body, soul, and spirit until the coming of the Lord. And so as we have this eager expectation, as we have this blessed hope within our lives, it should lead us, it should push us, it should drive us towards holiness, towards purity of life, towards integrity and uprightness, in putting away the sinful nature and turning towards the Lord. In the book of Revelation, it says, the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. And to her, it was granted that she should be arrayed or or dressed or presented in fine, clean linen, which speaks of the righteousness of the saints. And so God's calling us towards that. Number two, A diligent watchfulness, the the hope of the coming of the Lord, the blessed hope that he's given to to us should lead us to diligent watchfulness. How many here, I want to ask you to put up your hands, how many here, just say within the last month, you thought about the coming of the Lord? Did you ever get up one day within the last month and thought, hmm, Jesus may come today? If we didn't, Is there a diligent watchfulness? I fail in this area. But God asks us to have this diligent watchfulness. Again, in Titus 2, it says here, while we wait. While we wait. There's a diligent watchfulness that needs to be there. We are waiting for the coming of the Lord. And and it's difficult because you might think, well, you know, it's been 2,000 years almost, right? Right? Where is the Lord? We, we've waited and waited and waited some more, right? But there is a diligent watchfulness 
that he's expecting from our life. It's like uh, if, if, if children are waiting for their mom or dad to come home, right? And maybe mom or dad's gone on a long trip and they're coming back and maybe mom or dad has a gift and the child is waiting with what? Great expectation, wanting to see mom or dad or probably more importantly, wanting to see the gift that they bring, right, with them. They're watching, right? Or maybe, you know, in, in the day and world that we live in, maybe you're watching out for that Amazon package that you ordered, checking the tracking information, refresh, refresh, where is it? right, or whatever you might have ordered. And what are you doing? You're watching with great expectation. Maybe it's something that you ordered that, you're, you know, your, your, your new iPhone or your new Android phone or I ordered this thing or I ordered that thing and you're waiting and you're checking the tracking information and you're looking, car driving by, is that the delivery guy, you know? This is the kind of world that we live in, but are we waiting with such expectation for the coming of the Lord? Are we waiting for the coming of the Lord. In Matthew 24, it says this, so you too must keep watch, for you don't know what day your Lord is coming. See, this is why the coming of the Lord is often not talked about, because we've been waiting and waiting and waiting, and then after you wait and wait and wait for a long time, you think, ah, it's not gonna happen. But the word of God exhorts us and and, and invites us into this waiting. Luke chapter 12, it says this, it will be good for those servants, Jesus telling a parable here, whose masters find them watching when he comes. Truly I tell you, he will dress himself to serve and he will... Uh, will have them recline at the table and will come and wait on them. This is, it's a very interesting verse. We won't take time to read through the whole parable, but here he's talking about the servants that are waiting for their master to come back. And those that are waiting and watching, the master will come back and serve them because they have served well. And at the end of that parable in verse 40, it says, you also must be ready all the time for the son of man will come when least expected. In a time when we don't think that the Son of Man is coming. In a time when we don't think that Jesus might return, he's going to come back. Number three, patience in character transformation. The blessed hope will give us patience in character transformation. As it says here in Titus 2 and verse 14, he talks about here how the Lord gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us, to make us his very own people, totally committed to good doing good deeds. There's this transformation that happens from from darkness to light, a transformation that happens from from sin to righteousness. A transformation happens from us being alienated from the life of God to us being the very people of God. Uh, A transformation that happens from doing evil deeds and doing good deeds and doing the will of the Lord. And so there's this patience and character transformation. It takes time. As we walk with the Lord, as we surrender to the Lord, the blessed hope gives us patience towards this character transformation. Look at how James says it. He, he uses a, a, a farming analogy here. He says, your dear brothers and sisters, be patient as you wait for the Lord's return. We're waiting for the Lord's return. In a similar way as how we're waiting for the Lord's return, we also have to similarly wait for fruit or character transformation to happen in our life. How many times do you and I get discouraged thinking, oh man, I'm the same person that I was 10 years ago. And maybe we look at our lives and think, Lord, what are you doing? Where where is this change? But it's the spirit of the Lord as we have this blessed hope. Why? Because remember, as we talked about, if we have the blessed hope, then what are we doing? We are purifying ourselves just as he is pure. As we are doing that, there's character transformation that is happening. Consider the farmers who patiently wait for the rain in the fall and in the spring. They eagerly look for the valuable harvest to ripen. You too must be patient. Take courage for the coming of the Lord is near. We partnered with the Urban Farm Initiative and we're going to use some of our land to to harvest some of our land for crops. So we made the announcement a couple of weeks ago. Are you going to go outside right now and say, hey, where are the crops? What happened? No. Why? Because it takes... Time. It takes time for, for the fruits to be born. It takes time for the crops to come. And similarly in our lives, as we have this blessed hope, there is a character transformation. Paul says it this way in Romans, an endurance develops, or endurance or patience develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this salvation can speak of the final salvation as well when Jesus returns for us. And this hope will not lead to disappointment for we know how God 
dearly, how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. See, there's this, this hope that God gives to us as we patiently wait, as there's endurance, it develops strength of character. And that strength of character develops hope for the final salvation. And as God's Holy Spirit is poured out in our lives, it, he pours out his love in us. And from that comes, as, as we've read before in Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. How many, how many of us, if we went through this list and we're trying to tick off some of these things, maybe, you know, there might not be many ticks? Well, don't worry. That's why there is patience. That's why there is the blessed hope. If we have this hope, we will purify ourselves just as Jesus is pure. We will yield ourselves to the Lord. Number four, there's an expectation for the greatest reward. Okay, so Jesus is coming back. He's coming with a reward with him. If I were to ask you, when Jesus returns, what's the best reward that you would like? Big mansion in heaven? What's the best reward? A big crown so that everyone knows how great and awesome you are? What's the best reward that you can get? An expectation for the greatest reward. The blessed hope comes with this expectation for the greatest reward. What, do you th- what would it be for you? Jesus. Jesus. Exactly. Jesus is the greatest reward. It's not all the other things. And there are other things that come along with it. In Titus 2, it says this. While we, wait, while we look forward with hope to that wonderful day, what are we looking for? The glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus. That's why we've been talking about Jesus for the whole last year. That's the whole reason we've been resetting and refocusing on who Jesus is. Because he is the greatest reward. The blessed hope in our lives refocuses us on that great reward. There's so many times and opportunities when our eyes falter away. That's why we we, we sang the song today, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his glorious face. That's the greatest reward. That's the best reward. That's the fullest reward. That reward is unlike any other reward. Now, he does say that there are other things that come along with it. In Revelation chapter 3, he says, there's a a message to the church in Philadelphia. He says, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take away your crown. There is that, that blessed hope. There is that reward that's also there. Let's bring it back, though, to Jesus. He's coming with rewards. There are rewards for for what uh, we are doing to serve the Lord. But the greatest and most personal and most amazing reward there is, is Jesus. There are lots of things that are happening in the church world and in culture today. And it can bring lots of confusion and can bring lots of doubt, could bring lots of questions and misunderstanding. There are a lot of things that are going on in our world and in, our, and in the church world today. And we might wonder, Lord, why did you allow this? Or why did this happen? Or why is this? Or why is that? Friends, can I ask you to do this one thing? Let's reset and fix our eyes on Jesus. There's so many ways that the enemy will want to take us away from Jesus. There's so many ways in which he'll cause us to stray away from what's really important. But let's turn our eyes upon Jesus. That's what we've been doing for this last year. We want to continue to look to Jesus. He promises us at the end in Revelation 22, the last chapter in the Bible, look, I am coming soon. Now, you might be wondering, soon, Lord, it's been about 2,000 years. But yes, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. The greatest reward that Jesus can give us is himself. Number five, the blessed hope also drives us towards comfort in times of sorrow. In Titus chapter 2, it talks about this. He says, for the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. See, there is comfort in times of sorrow for us. If we know that our loved ones are followers of Jesus, there is a renewal. There is a time and a place in which we can come uh, and, and be able to see our loved ones again. 
because of that blessed hope. Because salvation is for all people. It's not just for one group or not just for another group, but it's available for everyone. And if we are able to share that love and hope of Jesus with other people, for them to come to know Jesus, it gives us great consolation and hope when our loved ones pass on. This past week, um, somebody that was really near and dear to Laura and I passed away on Saturday. He was the executive director of Pioneers Canada, where Laura works. And um, he gave the message at our wedding. And he was one of those people, have you ever had people in your life that believe in you more than you believe in yourself? We all need people like that. He was like that for me. He believed in me more than I believed in myself. He spoke life into me. Whenever I had the opportunity just to spend some time with him, he was such an encourager. And we were going to stay actually at his house this week. We were were in London this past week, London, Ontario, and we were going to stay with them. And unfortunately, because he passed away, we weren't able to do that. But there is still such a comfort and hope and rejoicing that one day I'll be able to see him again. That one day, even though there's sadness and grief at his sudden passing, that there's still such great hope to be able to see him again. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul writes this, and he says, Now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died, so you will not grieve like people who have no hope. Some of you in recent days, and even within this last year and recent months, have lost loved ones. But the word of God says here is that we don't grieve like others grieve because we have a hope. We have that blessed hope. That blessed hope of Jesus' return drives us to comfort and consolation. And so we can believe in that. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. See, there's great comfort and consolation and hope that God gives to us because of the truth and the fact that Jesus is our coming king. And then he ends that portion of scripture at the end of chapter four. He says, then we will be with the Lord forever. And he concludes and says, so encourage each other. Or in another translation, it says, so comfort each other with these words. Friends, if you've lost a loved one recently, if there's someone that's in your life who was a follower of Jesus, and they've gone on to be with the Lord now, we take comfort and consolation that if we follow Jesus as well, if we make him our Lord and Savior, that one day there will be a great reunion. That one day we will be able to rejoice together with Jesus and our loved ones. Oh, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout, the victory. There's such comfort and consolation. Uh, In in Revelation, John says it like this. He says, he will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, write this down for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. Behold, I am making all things new. The old has passed, the new has come. This is what Jesus is doing. He is able to make all things new. He's able to wipe away all tears and all sorrow. It's the beauty of serving and following Jesus. Oh, what a day of rejoicing that's going to be. Number six, the blessed hope drives us, gives us, births within us a missional theology. And I can't emphasize this enough. Titus chapter 2 and verse 11. For the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. The blessed hope drives us to share the word of God, share the hope of Jesus with all people. This is what we are called to do. Matthew 24, Jesus says this. And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it. And then the end will come. Or in other words, and then... Jesus will return. Friends, we have a mandate and we have a mission to reach the unreached, to take the gospel to places where people have never heard because we are waiting in great expectation for Jesus' return. Can I challenge you with this one thing? What are you going to do with the next decade of your life? If you're 25, what are you going to do from 25 to 35? 
If you're 30, what are you going to do from 30 to 40? If you're 40, what are you going to do from 40 to 50? If you're 50, what are you going to do from 50 to 60? If you're 60, what are you going to do from 60 to 70? If you're 70, what are you going to do from 70 to 80? If you're 80, what are you going to do from 80 to 90? And why do I say the next decade? We are living in the year 2023. In 10 years' time, it's going to be the year 2033. Now, we don't know for sure, but we can't say 100% for sure, but more than likely, Jesus probably died and rose again, 8033. 2023 will mark the 2,000th year anniversary of Jesus' resurrection. We are waiting for Jesus to return. But the gospel needs to go out to all places before that happens. And so can I challenge you to look at your life and ask yourself, in the next 10 years from now, 2023 till 2033, what am I going to do to make a difference with the gospel of Jesus Christ here in this world? What am I going to do with my life that will impact the kingdom of God for this next decade? What am I going to do to have a significant impact in reaching the unreached, in sending forth the gospel of Jesus Christ to those who don't know? And the nations have come to us here in the greater Toronto area. We have the privilege and the opportunity of taking the gospel to the unreached even within our own community. What is the impact that we will have in the next 10 years? What is the impact that Unionville Alliance Church will have in the next 10 years? What are we going to do before 2033 if the Lord gives us that amount of time? That will have a significant impact. To mi- what, how are we going to be disciple-making disciples for the kingdom and glory of God? Nikki Gumbel, who's the pioneer of Alpha, and we run Alpha here a couple of times in the year, and he stepped down from his position as vicar of Holy Trinity Brompton, and he's dedicated his life, he said, from until 2033, or as many years as the Lord will give him, but particularly until that year, he said, he's dedicating it to make Alpha available to everyone on the planet. That's what his goal is for the next 10 years. Rick Warren uh, leading an organization called Finishing the Task. And Finishing the Task is working on getting people a Bible, a believer, and a body of Christ to every people group on the planet by 2023, 2033. This is what their mission is, finishing the task. Finishing the task exists to convene and to catalyze the global body of Christ towards the goal of ensuring that everyone everywhere has access to a Bible, believer, and body of Christ. What, is, what are we going to do in this next decade? What kind of impact are we going to have? This movement, I'm reading now from their website as they talk about what their movement is. This movement began in the year 2000 with the goal of synthesizing data towards tracking and engaging the unengaged, unreached people groups of the world. Now with the 2000th anniversary of the Great Commission, Jesus is called to make disciples of all nations in sight in AD 2033. Finishing the task is rallying churches, organizations to collaborate in new ways and work towards broader uh, cooperative goals in Bible translation and engagement, evangelization and witness empowerment and church planting. Friends, what are we going to do? I'm telling you what they're doing. What are we going to do? What are you going to do? What What am I going to do? What is Unionville Alliance Church going to do in the next 10 years to make a significant impact on our world in reaching the unreached with the gospel before 20 33. Here, this is what they say about Bibles. They want everyone on earth to have access to a Bible in their heart language by 2033. There are approximately 2,002 languages that have no Bible translation and 3,425 more where only portions of the scripture have been made accessible. Our goal is to see the start of Bible translation in each language by 2025 and the entire Bible translated into every language by 2033. That's a tall task. How about believers? 
We want everyone on earth to hear the good news from a believer who shares their personal story. How about us? Are we sharing our personal story with those that are around us? As different groups embrace new advances in technology and then collaborate together, we are looking to develop fresh and spirit-led strategies which will enable access to a life-changing presentation of the good news to those who have never heard. Share your story. Tell your story. Tell of God's goodness in your life. How about this? Bodies of Christ. We want everyone on earth to have access to a body of Christ, a local church where they can fellowship. We're so blessed here in Canada that we have so many churches that are around us that we can attend. We have so many opportunities. In Thailand, it's not, it's not the case. In so many other unreached places, it's not the, not the case. Here they say, growing, reproducing disciples are made within the body of Christ, the local church. Church planting movements are working together in accelerated ways towards the shared goal of seeing a church created for every thousand people worldwide. Towards this goal, we aim to see a church planting movement engaged in every people group and every place by December 31st, 2025. That's just two years, a little bit more than two years away. That's a tall task. Last one, breakthrough in prayer. We want every person on earth prayed for by name at least once by 2033. That's a tall task, isn't it? You want to join that? I want to join that. That every single person on earth will be prayed for by name at least once before 2033. Through prayer, we are led and empowered to do what Jesus commands us to do. Praying for a breakthrough to overcome seemingly impossible challenges and situations that are way beyond our control is necessary. We cannot complete the Great Commission without fervent, intentional, and concerted prayer. We're starting our prayer walks this, this Tuesday. Do you want to join us? As we walk around, we're going to be doing one time it's going to be around this community, and then the next prayer walk is going to be around your own community. We'll join on Zoom. We'll pray for 15 minutes uh, for those ones that are being prayed around in your community. The ones that are happening here, we'll join together and pray for a while, and then we're going to go out and do our prayer walks. But the ones in your community, will join on Zoom so we can all pray together, and then you walk around your community and you pray. But friends, this is a tall task as well. That every single person, there's billions and billions and billions of people in the world that each and every person would be prayed for by name before 2033 so that they would know the love and grace of Jesus Christ. Friends, can I challenge you? Can I exhort you? Can I encourage you? What are you going to do with your life in this next decade? Put your age right here, whatever it might be. You might say, I am 23 or I am 56. Add 10 years to that if the Lord were to give that to us. And in 10 years' time, when you look back, Will you be able to say, yes, I have used that 10 years in significant ways to make an impact for Jesus Christ so that the gospel will go forth, so that as we wait for the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, as we wait for that blessed hope, we are sharing and proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can we try that? Can I give that as a piece of homework? And as you think about it, I'd love to hear what you're going to do with the next 10 years. Text me, call me, email me. I'd love to pray with you towards that. What are you going to do for the next decade of your life? 2033 is around the corner. It's going to be a great celebration. It's going to be a great anniversary. What are we going to do? Number seven, the last thing as we close. The blessed hope leads us towards the reality of heaven. Friends, heaven is real. Heaven is true. I remember um, our dear sister Edna Eid who passed away a few months ago and I remember visiting with her just a couple of, a couple of weeks before she passed away and she had such a confidence of heaven. She had such a reality of heaven. She had such a desire to be with Jesus. She knew that heaven is real. Paul says it this way in Philippians, but we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives and we are eagerly waiting for him to return 
as our Savior. We are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. There is a heaven, and he has gone to prepare a place for us. Jesus said it this way in John chapter 14. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home. There is so much room in the the father's home that we need to go to the highways and byways. We need to go out to the unreached places and invite them all to come in so that the father's home will be full. Friends, that's what God is calling us to do. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. Do you want to be in the Father's home? Have you ever traveled and then you stayed at a hotel or an Airbnb and you're living out of your suitcase and you're doing, you know, this and that? Laura and I were doing that this past week. And then we got home on on Friday night and it was like, ah, (laughs) nice to be home. Have you ever felt that? Like multiply by 10, 100,000, that's what it's going to be like when we get to heaven. I've gotten home to my father's house, to my eternal dwelling, to where I am. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. But he's revealed it to us by his spirit. There's a song written called, I Can Only Imagine, and it talks about, we can only imagine what it'll be like when we walk those streets of gold, when we see the Father's face. In Revelation 22, it says like this, no longer will there be a curse upon anything. No more curse, isn't that amazing? For the throne of God and the Lamb will be there and his servants will worship him and they will see his face. Do you want to see the face of the Father? And his name will be written on their foreheads and there will be no night there and no need for lamps or sun for the Lord God will shine on them and they will reign forever and ever. What will it be like when we step into heaven? When we close our eyes here on earth and we open our eyes in heaven. Can I ask you to do one thing? Can you close your eyes for a second? I want to read you a poem and I want you to just think of the words of this poem as I read it to you. Just close your eyes and picture what it will be like as we come into that eternity in in heaven. Heaven is real. This poem is written by James Hewitt. I often read it at funerals, but I'm going to read it for you this morning. What must it be like to step on a shore and find it to be heaven? To take hold of a hand and find it to be God's? To breathe a new air And find it to be celestial. To feel invigorated. And find it to be immortality. To rise from the care, the loneliness, and turmoil of earth. Into one unbroken calm. To wake up. And find it to be glory. Wouldn't that be an amazing day? Wouldn't that be a wonderful day? Worship team, please come. Timothy Keller passed away recently, and he's written a lot on so many different topics. And I was interested to hear some of his final words. This is is what he said near the end of his life. He said this, I'm thankful for all the people who've prayed for me over the years. I'm thankful for my family that loves me. I'm thankful for the time God has given me. But I'm ready to see Jesus. I can't wait to see Jesus. Send me home. Isn't that an amazing hope to have? Part of his final words were this. There is no downside for me leaving. Not in the slightest. There is no downside. Heaven is real. It's amazing and it's wonderful. Can you stand with me? Can we read this verse together? Revelation chapter 22, this is from verses 17 and verse 20. I've just put it together. I'll read it first. It says, the spirit and the bride say, come. Let anyone who hears say, come. He who, is fa- he, he who is the faithful witness to all these things say, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Let's read that together. The spirit and the bride say, come. Let anyone who hears say, come. He who is the faithful witness to all these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, 
Lord Jesus. Can I invite you today, as we get ready to sing, if you've never committed your life to Jesus Christ, and if you're here today and you're hearing all these things and you're wondering and you're questioning and not sure of where you might be if you die today, can I invite you into a relationship with Jesus because he wants to give you a blessed hope for eternity, a blessed hope for his coming. Our prayer team is gonna be here at the front and we would love to pray for you at the end of the service. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, don't wait. We invite you. Jesus is real. Heaven is real. He wants to give you his saving grace the free gift of eternal life. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. But the gift of God is eternal life. If we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we will be saved. It's a promise for you and a promise for me so that we don't need to fear death, but we can live with the hope of eternal life. Let's sing to the Lord.